the process. You, you have one, two, three, four, five. There was five steps in your in your process in in building a million dollar business in ninety days. I, and I mean that's like a big goal. And some people run their businesses for fifteen years and never tap into a million dollars uh, or a million dollar valuation in their business. I want to change lives. I want to show people how to progress in their money. I want to show people how to progress in their mindset. I want to show people how to progress in their brand so that way they can take care of their family, take care of their finances, and experience freedom. Welcome to the Andy R. Day Show, man. I'm super excited and elated to have today Brett Beveridge. Now, he's the founder and CEO of T-Rock, and I'm going to share with you a little bit what T-Rock is. And he's a still entrepreneur. He thrives on building successful businesses from the ground up. He's helped over six businesses hit this hit the the Inc. 500. Inc. 500 is that right, Bever Mr. Beveridge? Inc. 500, 5,000. Yeah, fastest growing companies. That's over right. the last twenty years, on, he's been on that list uh, like over thirteen times now. <laughs> over thirteen times. I mean, he's founded over. He's founded. He's founded more than twenty companies. And I was super excited. He's he's been in the wireless industry, the technology. He's been with startups. He's been with software. Man, and he's also been part of IPOs, man. I'm so excited to deep dive into the mind of Bet Beverage, man. Welcome to the Andy Day Show, man. How are you doing today? I'm feeling old after that introduction, man. I'm doing great, and I'm feeling a little old now. <laughs> man, I, maybe let, let's look at it on a positive side. Let's say, man, you got some wisdom and experience to really tap into gifts to entrepreneurs to go into the next level, would you say? Yeah, I think you got to tell my kids that I have wisdom because they don't believe that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's kind of natural, right? To say, hey, I, Dad, I saw you in your underwear one time. Dad, come on, man. You got wisdom. I feel that. It's true. No, no, it's been a fun ride. It's, it's been a great experience. There's been, it's kind of like, you know, the roller coaster you always hear about. There's no kind of straight line for success. So uh, I was mentioning earlier that, you know, entrepreneurs love the highs of the highs and we put up with the lows because the highs are so great. So yes, it's, it's, and it's great to be here. Thank you for having me today. Man, I feel that, uh, Brett, and I'm I'm super excited because, you know, this is also for my audience, but also for me, I'm a 27-year-old entrepreneur. I've been in business for uh, for nine years going on now, and so you're someone I get to really tap into and, and learn from. So not only is this for my audience, but I get to learn a, a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of knowledge. So, I hope so. You know, let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. When you're working with, when you're communicating or, or mentoring someone who's starting their business, right? When we, let's, let's go straight into it, right? We'll tap into your story as well throughout. But when you're communicating with someone who's starting their business, what do you see is the, the most common challenge in startups and growing their businesses in the beginning phases? Maybe stage one or stage two of their business growth. I think this is a great question, by the way. There's not just one thing. I think you have to focus on resources. You know, do you have the financial wherewithal or at least have line of sight to the financial wherewithal that you're going to need to support yourself and to support your business and invest properly in your business along the way? And I've started companies out of the back of a van selling cell phones at grocery stores all the way through to funding through venture capital and through bank debt and through, through IPOs. So you got to make sure you have the right resources and, and resources also mean the, means the right amount of time. So you have to have time, you have to have energy, you have to have capital, you have to have a little bit of blind faith. You also have to know that life isn't fair all the time. So you're gonna be thrown a lot of curveballs, some of which might feel impossible to get out of, but through just sure will and determination, hard work, trust, relationships, and communication, you can navigate through almost anything. And I have a whole lot of stories if we have time to share one or two of how we were faced staring down the precipice of failure and somehow found a way to drag our way out of that and later become a public company. So uh, that's that would be my initial advice. But I'd also say if you love what you're doing and you're passionate, uh, that you should go for it. How long were you selling cell phones for? Back in 1989, uh, I was in college. And uh, a college mate of mine, we happened to work together. I was putting myself through school, working in the health club space. Uh, started this out of a van in 1989. We used to drive around the shopping centers and banks and malls and whip out our van door and show you the couple of big phones that were available. And we later, about seven years later, through a lot of uh, hard work and some venture capital and some angel funding and some bank debt, we grew that that chain of stores to about 300 across the country uh, of independent uh, wireless independent stores. And 
again, we took that company public in 1997 with Smith Barney and with Merrill Lynch at the time. What, so was, the, about, what was the name of that company? It was called Let's Talk Cellular and Wireless. Let's Talk Cellular and Wireless. And so a buddy, a buddy of mine, when we, we both dropped out of college at the same time, we went mm-hmm. and opened up a cell phone store in the kiosk in the malls. And uh, we, we franchised with Metro PCS and uh, Simple Mobile. And we opened up that location and it went from one, two, three, four, and we grew that. So when you said the cell phone industry and I, and I, and I read your bio, I said, I said, man, I can't wait to tap in and, and, and see, you know, the relation there. That's amazing. That's, that's impressive, man. 300 locations. Yeah, thank you. And by the way, it was in malls and the first location was a kiosk. It was in the middle of a mall called Dadeland Mall, which happened to be halfway between my house and my partner's house. And, and that 144 square feet, you know, you know what they are. You've done yeah. it. We were doing two million dollars out of 144 square feet, so that's what kind of gave us the the tiger by the tail mentality, and we knew we just had to keep rolling these things out across the country. So it was a lot of fun. Question for you: Did you guys finance, or or was it straight cash, cash and credit cards? Complete bootstrap, my friend. We uh, we had no, no, no cash for for your customers. For your customers, did you finance your customers? Did did, did you give them a loan on the phone? At the time, uh, there was no financing, but if you also remember, in the very, very beginning, a big brick mobile phone or a bag phone used to cost $800 to $1,000, so mm. there was cash. But over the years, a short period of time later, phones were given out for free because right. it was almost like the razor, razor blade, blade mentality. So that someone would walk away with a free phone, and then they would just sign up for a two- or three-year agreement, and that's how the carriers made their money over time. Oh man, impressive, impressive. So what was the biggest learning curve? Because that was your first, that was your first like enterprise that you built, right? And Correct. was that the building blocks of the other companies that you grew in? I'm still in the kind of assisted sales and training and 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 the sale of complicated products and services like cell phones were back in the day. I still own about 175, whether it's T-Mobile or Xfinity or US Cellular or other brands uh, that we, we own and operate ourselves. So I'm still in that space today. But the core of being able to help a person that needs to choose between lots of different phones and lots of different rate plans and different colors and different kind of storage facilities and speed and all of that, how do we get that person in the, in the right phone that meets their needs? And that can hold true with selling Comcast cable services or any kind of electronics device, uh, or even other types of products and services, it really needs someone to talk to you about that and answer questions. And together, you come up with the right products and services that meet those needs. Now, how old were you? So you you were in college. Did you graduate college afterwards? I did. I, I started this uh, when I was a senior in college, and I did finish somehow. I was working a full-time job and going to school full-time and then started this as well. But it was only for about three months that I had that that triple duty, and then I graduated and uh we kept going. So when you started that business, how old were you? 22 or three, 23. 23. Okay. And then f- what was your second business that you started after the first one, after the cell phone stores? The second one was not a bootstrap. The second one was a, an exciting uh, dot com. And now we're talking about 1997, 1998, about a year after we took Let's Talk Cellular and Wireless Public, I went out to Silicon Valley and on the way to Silicon Valley, I created a PowerPoint on the way. That was my business plan. And by the time I left, we had raised $23 million from Goldman Sachs and all the Silicon Valley based venture firms like Excel Venture Partners and HIG and Redpoint. And the concept between, behind that was to do exactly what we did on the bricks and mortar side with wireless. We did it online. Okay. And um, what, was that, what was that business? That was called Let's Talk.com. Okay, is, it, is that still operating? That, uh, we didn't use all of our money on a Super Bowl commercial, so we survived. <laughs> and, there are people uh, that, that do that, huh? Oh yeah, man, you, you have no idea. Uh, we became uh, tied with the first, we were either number one or two online doing that and eventually sold to a company called Brightstar, which is the largest wireless phone distributor in the world. Uh, and then it sold to Target after that. So yeah, it uh, was a successful exit. And I wasn't with the company at that time. I stayed for about a year, year and a half to really get the foundation in place and get the website up and running and hire a strong management team. And I stayed on the board, but then I had to come back to the bricks and mortar company and do a complete turnaround because while I was gone from the bricks and mortar company, 
it got into a real bad situation. So it's one example of having to come into a situation, like I mentioned before, that seems impossible to navigate through. And uh, banks are telling you they're not going to give you any more money. And you're really strapped for paying employees and buying inventory and all of those things. But somehow we found a way to turn that business around in a very short period of time uh, before we actually then sold this public company to Nextel Communications. And now we're talking the year 2000. So, so we're at 2000. I originally told you that this interview is going to be 30 minutes, man. We're going to tap into a little bit more than 30 minutes. Sound good? <laughs> yep. Just, let, just, just keep me going. If you I'm so going too slow. Cool. So uh, you started in 1989. So in 1989, you're 23 years old at that, at that point. And then 11 years later, you're, you're two, in 2000. That's when you sold the business to Nextel. Correct. And then I uh, stayed on as a consultant at first. I didn't want to join the company. I don't know if you remember Nextel Communications, but it was a wireless phone provider. They had the walkie-talkie feature. Where you, uh, where you at? Yep. Yep, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> And uh, I ran the I they I ran the store division. So I would they bought about 250 of my stores, and then an AT and T bought the rest. And then we took that 250 stores. We added another 700 stores in three years. Uh, so that brought the Nextel corporate retail stores to around 900 or so. And then I also ran the national retail division, which is where Nextel was sold inside of places like Best Buy and Walmart and Target and uh, other other points of distribution. Well, I stayed there for about three, three or four years. And then when Sprint and Nextel merged, they offered me a role, but I was dying to get back in my entrepreneurial itch was there. And so I decided to leave and start what is now called T-Rock. And now we're talking 2004 or five. And that's the revenue optimization company. Correct. Question for you. When you're, when you're running a business that big, so 700 locations or, or even 150 locations, how is the money managed? So when you're, on an, when you're an entrepreneur, you're a business owner, and you have maybe 50 employees, you're doing uh, less than half a million or maybe, maybe a million, a couple million, you're the one kind of managing the money. At what point does it transition that you need a team to essentially manage your money for you where, where you expose yourself to risk? I think very early on in the process, like if you have a really small business, really small, then QuickBooks is your best friend and you can multitask and learn how to do basic, uh, you know, accounts payable, accounts receivable, and, and you can manage that way. But very early on in the process with T-Rock, uh, I brought in a, a VP of finance at that point who stayed with me all the way through from 2005 through Wow, 2018, unfortunately, he passed away. God, God rest his soul. Uh, but I think very early on in the process. So we, we have to understand now we have about 10,000 full-time uh, W-2 and part-time employees. We have a gig workforce of about 20,000. We operate in every state here in the United States, plus Canada, uh, Mexico, and the rest of LATAM. So we have a lot of activity, a lot of different customers. Uh, the 150 stores is just a, a small portion of our business. So making sure you have tight finances and getting reporting that's accurate and getting it quickly can either help your business or quickly destroy your business when you're, when you can't make the decisions fast enough, if that makes so, sense. So between, nine, let's say this, between 1989 to 2022, between all your companies in one single year, not one company, but all the companies, what's the highest top line that you saw in all your businesses combined? Uh, in a single year, I would say we're, we're private company. We don't share a lot of that, but over 300 million in, in top line revenue. Okay. So over 300 million now with that 300. So are you in at that stage, are you using QuickBooks? Are you using something else? What does that look like? I'm, I'm, it, it sure. interests me to see what, what at that, you know, that level, how do you manage finances at that specific level? Is there an accounting department? Is there a bunch of college graduates managing the funds? Um, do other people have access to it? Like, how, how does you as the owner feel comfortable, number one? Number two, the processes that allows the business to scale that, that big as far as the finances? So the answer is QuickBooks can take you a long, long way. It, it, you don't, I don't think we switched from QuickBooks to we use NetSuite today until probably 100, and, 100 million plus in revenue, maybe 145 million in revenue. So and for yes. someone who's who's let me just uh, stop you. So for someone who's making making three million dollars a year right now, they can 
literally fathom that, hey, I can use QuickBooks all the way into the $100 million uh, uh, a year range? I, I think we were only pushing the upper scale of it, but we absolutely did that and absolutely have an accounting department. Only one or two people to this day, really? uh, plus myself, have access to do wire transfers and to sign checks and to kind of uh, impact the money or to be able to get their hands on, on the cash. And we do that for their protection and for our own protection. So the answer is now we have a, a large accounting department. We have multiple people and accounts payable, accounts receivable, reporting functionality. We have many accountants that are handling some of these programs that report to the controller. The controller and the CFO and myself are the only ones that can physically you know, move money around or take money out or do wire transfers or sign checks to this gotcha. day. And between, I mean, with over 10,000, 10,000 W-2s and, and 20,000 uh, uh, gig workers, I'm sure you've exposed yourself to some risk since between 1989 to now. What are some, some challenges, if you have a story, we can tap into the stories now, some challenges that you've experienced that allowed you to really transition your business so to protect yourself moving forward? So a challenge that took place and, and then you, you know your response to that challenge. I'll, I'll first start by saying that a company will generate as much revenue as it's capable, as it's built to support. So you're not going to do 300 million with an infrastructure that can support 10 million. You're going to do 10 million in that situation. So you always have to be investing. You always have to be looking forward. You have to have a desire, first of all, to scale. And every investment you make needs to be able to have scalability in mind. So when, and, and yes, I've bumped my head many, many, many times, you know, not keeping as close a track of accounts receivable uh, and me discovering that we have people that owe us money for 60, 90, 120 days, having to try to collect that money that far out is really, really difficult to do. So making sure that you have processes in place, that you have technology in place, but that you shouldn't have to work for the technology. The technology needs to work for you. So you build your processes that make your business work. You have to be very disciplined, particularly on the finance side, or you can get quickly into harm's way. And that means scrutinizing every new hire. That means establishing a budget. That means measuring your results against that budget. That means saying no to some things. Is it a must have or is it a want? Which, what's the difference? How critical is this to our business? So it never ends. And I'll tell you what, if we didn't have tight controls in place, you know, do you know how many times someone has sent a spam or a faux email to my controller that said, hey, it's Brett, just send me 175,000 to Zurich right now. I'll, I'll tell you why later. One time it happened. One wow. time that actually happened and we were able to, to actually reverse the the wire before it physically transferred to that other account holder. But it's things like that, you know, you plan the best you can, but some curveball like that's going to happen. You just nip it in the bud when it happens and you don't let it happen a second time. I mean, we just discovered that, I mean, I mean, Facebook, they went out public Facebook. I believe it was Facebook and Google where there was full invoices sent and with, with transcriptions of, of communication, the whole nine yards of in the millions and the company actually paid out on those invoices. So they're having their own legal battle to, to, to discover that. Okay, so so give me an example of, of one of the processes. So so is that the challenge that you experienced? Is that the the full the the, the full 175 grand, the full invoice of the 175 grand? And then how did you fix it? Well, we just put a process in place that that I have to approve any kind of wire. Or there's three people, like I said, that have the authority to do that. Two people need to approve such a wire. So. Even if I'm requesting a wire, I need to make sure that at least two people touch it. No one person can effectuate that. And then there's just checks and balances. We're also what's called SOC 2 compliant, SOC 2 compliant, which puts in, it's auditable. So you have to pass an audit in order to be at this stage and this level of, of security. We also have a software company. And because of that, we've, we've provided software solutions to Apple and to AT&T and to Comcast and to Facebook all these large enterprises. And in order for you to do that, you go through a lot of scrutiny and deep audit. So it's, it's a combination of, of uh, knowledge, um, discipline, and technology that will navigate through situations like that. Got it. At what point does, does the, 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 the reach of Brett and the leadership start to have a distance as you grow the business. So now we're tapping into the culture and we're tapping into employment and the W-2s. How, at what point do, do, do you completely are, are away from your frontline and the team members? 
Well, I'll tell you, I'm not completely away from them. I like to keep my, my ear close to the close to the ground, but I have an amazing team around me that are way better at doing the things that they specialize in. So for example, I have a software company. I love software. I can envision what software will do to solve people's problems, but I don't know how to write code. And I know a little bit now after all these years about how to develop software, but I have a COO. Let me just take a step back. So T-Rock, the revenue optimization companies is a platform. That platform has about seven or eight or nine companies underneath it, each providing specific services to our customers. All of them are complementary, so they're all related to retail, and all of them are either people solutions or technology solutions. So the person that runs my software division is an expert in software development. He's done it many, many times in the past, that's his pedigree. But that person would be a good, good person to run my mystery shop business, where we're going out and we're seeing what's happening in a retail store. What's the experience? How clean is the store? Were the associates trained and knowledgeable? Uh, and that mystery shop person might not do well at an overnight merchandising level two reset. So you've got to have a work belt on your belt. You got to be able to climb ladders, lift heavy things, organize, take things apart with drills and all of that. So those divisions are run by experts that we either homegrown or that we bring in from the outside that serve a, a particular role to run that particular business. So that's how we've been able to scale. We listen to our customers. They ask us if we can do something and whether we can or not, we say, yes, of course we can. <laughs> All entrepreneurs say yes first and figure it out later. And, uh, and then we make sure that our platform is built to support it. We make sure that it's scalable. We make sure that it's continuous and then we hire uh, the experts to support that business that will make it best in class. So if we can't be best in class, we're not interested in, in the business. Understood. Now, have you ever heard of the, the TV show Undercover Billionaire? I have. Okay. If you were on that show, what would be the steps for you to build a million dollar business in 90 days? If you want, if you, want you can take a minute to pause. If you're ready to go, let's lock and load. Yeah, I, I think the the uh, the pro process is the same for any business that I've ever built. Well, let me ask you this. Do you believe you could do it in 90 days? Can I build a million dollar business in 90 days? I think I could. I think I could. I really do. I think if you really keep your eyes open and you're, and you're understanding what problems are in the industry, I would make sure I picked certain components of that business. It would need to be scalable. It would need to be high margin. It would need to hopefully own no inventory. It would have to be residual income. One of the most important things I can share with your audience out there. I don't care what business you're in, you have to have residual income. You have to have some sort of subscription-based model. So you keep getting more and more customers you get, the more and more you collect on a monthly basis. And, uh, and then you've got to be able to learn how to scale. So, and I would, in that case, I would probably look for big, bigger ticket items that don't have a super long sales cycle. The balance between a super long time it takes to sell that product with a high revenue product. So for example, if I wanted to build a million dollar business in 90 days, I might consider being in the distribution business where I am distributing iPhones to small dealers or to big box retailers. Each iPhone costs a thousand dollars, right? So it doesn't take me very many to get to 10,000, to get to a hundred thousand, to get to a million a month, not, 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 not a million in three months. So you gotta think about what you know, what problem can be solved. And if your goal is to build a million dollar business and you, you put the components together that will allow you to build that million dollar business. Gotcha, gotcha. But and and because because I have context because I owned a company called Celsius Mobile, which was a distribution company for cell phones because of all of our cell phone stores. But the margin on those on those, I mean, you may have had a different deal than I had, but the margins on those phones typically aren't high are high margin on the on the cell phones when you're distribution. Correct. Yeah, you're right. You're right. But you're, the, the top line is high. The bottom line is gotcha. Is now, what you do in that situation is, how do you find subscription-based revenue from that? How do you provide ancillary services to that those customers that you're distributing to? People like training services, like um, you know, high high-end accessories that have very high margins for you. The handsets have low margins. The accessories have very high margins. 
So how can you repair the phones when they break? How can you trade in the phones when they need to get rid of them when they're overstocked? All of those things could be ancillary services that have much higher margins. In this, do, in this new day and age, would you ever get into digital marketing? It, and does that fit essentially running a high, serv, high revenue service business, service-based business, would you get into that space based on your framework? The answer is yes. And we have this technology that's called VIBA. VIBA stands for Virtual Interactive Brand Ambassador. And you can actually see it in action if you go to vibaconnect.com. And basically, we're kind of the engine that you've heard of omni-channel strategies before, I'm sure, uh, where you have in retail, you have buy online, or you have your bricks and mortar stores, or you have buy online pickup at store, or you might have curbside pickup, or you might have uh, the ability to return uh, items uh, at your doorstep. So there, you know, might have home delivery. Viva basically allows you to be online, for example, and you're looking at a complicated product or service, and you're just not getting the answers you need by reading the text. You, you try to use a text bot. Through Viva, you would click a web link right on your home screen, and it would, it would immediately connect to an experience just like this. So now you're talking to a live salesperson within three or four or five seconds. It's like Zoom on steroids. Mm -hmm. And I can push video to the screen. I can push comparisons to the screen. I can build your shopping cart for you. I can truly prescribe a solution for you that you didn't expect to get that experience by, by you know, going like this on your keypad right. at home. Now, let's say you're in a retail store and you're walking down, you're in Home Depot, let's say, and you're walking down the electronics, the, the electrical aisle because you're a homeowner and you need to fix something that's going on with your electrical system of your house. You used to be able to walk down that aisle and, and run into a Home Depot employee that was an electrician. Now there's no one to be found. What if you could scan a QR code right there on a display and now you're talking to a live electrician that's spread out over multiple stores? You follow me? So the electrician can get paid. I think paid. for a lot of retail people, like that was kind of like, that's like the dream when, when, you're, at, when you're in the headquarters and you're, you're saying, how could I service a lot of our customers without them having to go to this specific location? I think that's a, that, that's a dream. So you found a solution to a retail owner's dream. I tried to patent this in 1995 and the technology wasn't there and it wasn't ready yet. We have three patents pending on it right now and it's being used by some huge brands I can't mention, but brands that you would recognize. Some of them I mentioned uh, today already. It's an extremely robust technology it is 100% the next wave of an omni-channel strategy. And it's even going to be the next wave of all call centers out there. You'll be able to have, you know, you'll be able to be at home watch, eating dinner, watching TV, and up will come up a Cadillac commercial. And you see the Cadillac and you like it. And you can either call a phone number, but why not just scan a QR code? And right there, you're speaking to a live salesperson that's going to talk to you about that Cadillac and why you should, what the benefits are of that Cadillac. So this is it's going to disrupt and we're already seeing it starting to disrupt the entire industry. Very exciting stuff. But what I see is that based on what I'm hearing, now we have met, you have many businesses and we can't tap into all of them today. But what I'm understanding is that many of them service retail to a degree. Many of them. It, I would think retail managed services. That's our DNA. That's what we specialize in. So it's kind of B to C, business to consumer. And when consumers need guidance, help, a prescriptive solution, if they want to leverage, that could be auto. I mean, we actually have banks now that are interested in this technology so that when you're shopping online for a mortgage, you could instantly speak and link to a mortgage, a licensed mortgage broker. So we don't care if you use your own agents or you hire T-Rock to be the people site as well. You would be subscribing to a subscription-based model, a SaaS model to Viva for the platform. How, how was T-Rock impacted during COVID? It was uh, not as badly as others, but badly. Um, people just were not going to work. We were, we had our employees, uh, health and safety was our utmost concern. We definitely had stores that were closed for periods of time, especially when someone got infected, we would shut the store down and bring in cleaning crews to disinfect professionally that store. Uh, we have big box retailers. So we kind of adopted whatever their strategy was. If they were open, we were there. If they weren't open, we weren't there. It definitely did. Now it impacted it in a very positive way too. And if you have a minute, we can talk about what, how to pivot. 
yeah, so I want to tap into that that pivot, and then we could talk about crisis management. But was was it more the, the impact more internal or was it external with your customer base? It was both. I mean, because we had we shut down the office, so if we didn't go into COVID with a super strong culture, one that is was fun, one that was. Um, uh, entrepreneurial, one that was opportunistic, that was really close in nature. It would have. Been, we actually did better in 2020 than 2019. We did better in 2021 than 2020. So the answer is yes. Yep. But the culture is super important when you're when you're doing that. Now we had to pivot along the way. Again, we can talk about that whenever you want to to be able to achieve those numbers. But uh, you know, being able to navigate through a crisis is mission critical. So, so you 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 had you had these challenges that took place that were completely external to you, which was COVID nineteen, and then you there was somehow you were able to pivot. Culture was 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 important in that pivot, and also crisis management wasn't. Crisis management was important in that uh, that challenge. So, what are some of the things that you did? Like, how did you pivot in the midst of the nationwide you know shutdown and an impact of businesses? Sure, it's a great question. Uh, I steal a. The seven C's, I call it, and it was first uh, provided to me by Dean Quelch, who's the dean of the School of Business at University of Miami. And what you really need to do, and 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 and, and this crisis management comes before pivot. You got to get your people aligned and feeling calm. So the first C is crisis in crisis management is to remain calm. You have to be calm, and you have to instill a sense of calmness to your to your team members and to your people and to your customers and to your banks, whoever you, your constituencies are that you do business with. You have to have, have confidence that, and have them have confidence that we're going to be. It's confidence. Confidence. Third thing, and you can, I can't overemphasize this enough, is communication. You have to communicate, 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 over communicate. They have to see and hear your voice more than they ever have before. And again, I'm not just talking about your employees. I'm talking about your banks and your customers and, and shareholders. If you do have shareholders, anybody who has a stake in your business, you have to make sure you're honest, you're clear that you are, you are, you know, instilling that sense of confidence and the management team has this and we're going to see it through and we're going to take care of you. It's very, very important for that. You got to have compassion as well. And I don't just mean from the C-suite into the employee base. I mean, employee to employee. So you want employees showing compassion. For example, let's say that you have someone that is scheduled to work on Monday at 10 o'clock, but they can't because their mother has COVID or they have to be a caretaker that day because there's nowhere else for them to go or there's no daycare. Well, you know, a compassion means I can switch shifts with my coworker. They're going to cover for me because they know that I can't be there that day. So random acts of kindness. We were, we always have, uh, helped our employees when there's a fire and they have to move out of their home and they have no place to go, or if they have a family member that has COVID and they don't have health insurance, we as a company always make sure we contribute and help financially and provide whatever resources we can. Uh, I would say a sense of community as well. So you want to get involved. That's the other C of what's happening in your community. Keep, keep engaged, you know, read a lot and where you can contribute and help. I would do that. Uh, you have to make sure you have enough cash to weather the storm, right? You have to, you have to um, make sure your balance sheet is strong enough because if you do have a hit, if you're a restaurant, you have to close, you have to have enough cash to weather that storm. So these are the ways that I addressed and that I dealt with uh, how to navigate through a crisis situation. So it's calm, confidence, communication, compassion, collaboration, community, and cash are the seven. Amazing, amazing, man. We could take literally take this podcast and write a whole book, man. <laughs> well, I have one coming up. <laughs> right, just do it. Uh, do it. Do it anyway. Um, right. qu question, question for you. So it seems like this was already, you were already setting up for, your business was already set up for, uh, you know, this impact already because of the culture that you built. 100%. Because, because in order to- Very opportunistic culture. You can't scale- compassion, communication, collaboration. I mean, create calmness, of course. You can, you can communicate with technology nowadays. Confidence, you can come across confident. 
being calm, you can come across calm, but you can't scale compassion um, and collaboration and community from, you know, from Sunday to Monday. So you, you had to have started this in the beginning. So let's tap into that. How did you uh, pretty much create this culture where it allowed you to, to, to weather the storm of COVID-19? Yeah, I love, I love, this is probably one of my favorite questions because look, any, you have a culture. You know, I you have to say this was your favorite podcast ever, man. I was going to be excited. <laughs> it's going to be, it's going to be. I'm uh, you, you, you have a culture, even as an individual, as a person, you have a brand, right? You have things that you stand for. Your company, whether it's in writing or not right now, what you do for a living, there's a culture there. My first company, Let's Talk Cellular and Wireless, we really didn't have written core values. We didn't have a written kind of, you know, set of, of words and phrases that describe who we want to be, what we want to act like, but we had one and we happened to live by it. With T-Rock, we have a very defined set of core values. The first one is be an entrepreneur every day. Everyone in our company needs to be an entrepreneur every day. That's where the opportunity. Do you communicate that? Do you, do oh, my God, yes. Every, all the time. Every new employee gets trained. There's videos. I personally deliver a lot of that that initial first day orientation for employees. And there might be three or 400 at a time starting every Monday. We might have 300 people that are our new T-Rockers. We call them T-Rockers. <laughs> and then the second one is to- Hold on, hold on. Let, me, let me ask you a question. Cause, cause that, that saying, say from, coming from a C-suite saying, hey, become an entrepreneur, isn't that counterintuitive in comparison to them being a W-2? Another great question, man. You're, you're good. So. The answer is we want everyone having fun solving problems. That person that's in that big box retailer on a Sunday and someone else's house selling electronics at two o'clock, you know, we want, they know way more about that business than I do. They're the ones that are greeting customers and talking to customers. They're the ones that know when we're making them fill out stupid paperwork that is just standing in the way of them making more money or having more fun. So we absolutely want them and encourage them and actually have contests on how, how do you have fun making your own business work? How can you own your own piece of that business and be in charge of your career and be in charge of your paycheck? So it's, it's, it's an entrepreneurial environment because people feel fulfilled when they come back and they talk to one of us and say, hey, why are we doing this? And it's welcomed. I call it reverse mentoring. When, when I, they want advice from me, I'm getting advice from them. Tell me what we should do to make your life better. That's so they really, feel like entrepreneurs. That's really interesting, man. And, and, and uh, I forgot the author's name, but the, 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 one of the sales guys who developed the BDR role, business development role in Salesforce, he wrote a whole book about it. And he talked about creating many CEOs in the company. That's part of what scaled Salesforce. And for you at this stage of, of having 10,000 plus employees, I would assume that that would be a threat to communicate, become an entrepreneur, um, I know in my company that uh, a lot of the people who are close to me, because I teach entrepreneurs how to start and grow their business, that that they would essentially gain a lot of information from me and then go ahead and start their own business. Now I'm losing employees to, to, to essentially becoming competitors to a degree. And but what you're saying, no, let's embrace that and let's communicate. No, everyone here, you have an entrepreneur. This portion of T Rock is yours, and, and and take care of it and build a uh, uh, create create problem solving activities to, 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 you know, to fix challenges and so forth. And you're embracing that. Is that right? And get, and get rewarded for it. By the way, you know, we, by the way, remember I mentioned the platform, every one of our divisions has a, a leader, has someone who owns the PL, and they get paid on the performance of that division that they run, just like a hired gun CEO would get. They get a percentage of the profits that they generate from, from being that, that entrepreneur. But even below that, and, you know, throughout the organization, uh, we are, we, we applaud, we, we want them to look back at T-Rock. We have no non-competes in our business at any level. No one has a non-compete agreement. They can go when they want to go. It's my job. It's our job as leaders to have an environment where they want to stay. They want to thrive. They want to learn. They want to have fun, not take themselves too seriously, but really make an impact on their business. And people really like that. If they leave, all I want them to do is look back at T-Rock and say, that was the best place I ever worked. I probably want to come back there one day. I learned so much from them. They exposed me to so much on how I can do my own thing. And, and a lot of our employees are part-timers. They already have side hustles. And in, in the old days, that was frowned upon. I encourage it. If you are a rapper on the side, please do a rap song for T-Rock. If you make swag, 
on the side, let's put a T-Rock logo on it. Let's sell it and you can get the benefits from that. So it's, it's truly, a, you know, you're, we're drinking our own Kool-Aid when we talk about entrepreneurship. And that's just one of the core values. Gotcha, gotcha. So you look at it more as an advantage rather than a threat. And in, in, in your, I love that. I love, if you're deciding to go work for a company that's going to even maybe fund your business, if, it, if you do a Shark Tank, which we're, we're going to do this year, and I'll fund your business. So if I love your idea and you've gone through and you've shown me that you can produce and that you're trustworthy and that you, uh, you know, have the brain and mind and capacity to build your own business, I might fund it for it. Surely I'll help you, but I might even fund it for you. Or you can go work for the person that's saying, come here, work nine to five, keep your head down, don't make much noise, just do your job. Iron you ironically, go? ironically, we have a, I, I host a yearly event since 2017 called the Progression Conference. And so two to 300 people, entrepreneurs are coming to this event. And this year, I want to do something a little different where we're going to have a pitch-a-thon where different business owners, especially in tech, are going to get on stage in front of my group of investors. And it's just, I'm not involved in it whatsoever. I, besides filling up the room, I'm putting the investors in the room and then the, the pitch-a-thon, the, the, the founders or the, the business owners in the room, they had, they're pitching. So, so you're doing something similar. Is this going to be your first Shark Tank-like event? That you're doing? It will be this year. We've done, uh, you know, modified versions, but this will be a more formal, you know, like a really hyped up and bring your best ideas, put some thought into it, and we'll pick a winner, at least one, maybe more. Amazing, amazing. So, you know, one of the things that, so I'm going to tap into Do It Anyway, uh, that's going to be, when, when is that book going to be released? Do you have a date? I don't have a solid date. It's probably going to be in about six months. Uh, okay, in about six months. I so, if you, go to, if you go to breadbeverage.com, you can see it there. You can see what it's going to be about. But I'm happy to share a few minutes of it if you like. Yeah, um, I, I just want to ask you about the, the process. You, you have one, two, three, four, five. There was five steps in your, in your process in, in building a million-dollar business in 90 days. I, and I mean, that's like a big goal. And some people run their businesses for 15 years and never tap into a million dollars uh, or a million-dollar valuation in their business. So number one was scalable. Number two was high margin. Number three was no inventory. Number four was residual income. Uh, so something like subscription. And then number five was a bigger ticket with high revenue. Is there any missing elements that we should add in discovering a million-dollar business? I think that's going to be something that people are going to be like, like tune in on the ears. I, I think uh, the other ingredient that I enjoyed uh, both with my first company and with T-Rock, let's talk in T-Rock, is at the time they had low penetration. What does so that mean? That means that there's, there's a lot of room for growth. So it's not only scalable where you can, you can build the infrastructure to grow it, but there's, there's, a, there's kind of an untapped uh, competitive landscape or less like a blue ocean. There's a big need, but there's not a lot of people that can fill the need. So if you're trying to build cars and you think you want to be an auto manufacturer, other than unless you're Elon Musk, it's pretty hard to go out there and say, I'm going to start building cars. There's a lot of people that build cars and it's very competitive and you need a lot of cash, which I, I, I didn't have that first entity in that first company. So uh, I like something that I could, like a services business really probably encapsulates most of those five ingredients, six ingredients. Uh, but you definitely want something that it, it not only is built to scale, but it's, there's a demand, there's a need and a demand. So you really have to look and think about what problem can you solve out there that will be like, it's one of those where why didn't I think of that already? Why, how is this not out there already? Can cost allow you to not be, can the cost allow you to be low penetration? Meaning that if there is a, it's essentially to a degree, a red ocean where there's a lot of sharks in the tank, but they're all operating at such a high cost or a high price point for your customers that if you can come in at a lower cost, would that essentially be making you low penetration? hundred percent because you are creating a need. Uh, this happened to me in 2007, 2008. Uh, I was I was you know starting this company pretty much from scratch, and we had uh, uh, the the financial crisis hit us. If you re remember that, where all the real estate tanked and right. financial markets crashed, and I was I had no customer. I mean, my customers couldn't afford me, so I had to pivot, like like I did here in COVID, and decide what is it that my customers need. What do they they need more sales and they need less cost. So how can I build a business that will give them more sales and less cost in the in the face of this financial crisis that's going on? So that's what we built. That's what we did. That's what we created. 
And that's what, it was cheaper for people to use my company than to have their own people. So they outsourced that to me. And by the way, my people produced more than their people did because that's all I was focused on doing. So a whole other section we can do on insourcing versus outsourcing, but we turned ourselves into a retail managed service outsourcing platform so that you could, we could do it better, smarter, faster, cheaper than you can. Amazing, amazing, man. You'd be amazed by the, by the brands, by the companies that you would think, well, they don't need you. Who are you? This is Walmart. This is Best Buy. This is Target. This is, you know, Home Depot. This, you know, fill in the blank. They are good at a lot of things, but they're not good at everything. So they, they need help with uh, certain types of services that, that you can provide. And once you have a marquee customer like that, guess what? The snowball gets bigger. Yeah, now I can only imagine. I can only imagine. Now, now in, in that experience, I'm just curious, is that experience, is it white label to the point where the cust- their customer has no clue? It, uh, listen, I've done white label programs where I walk in and I'm wearing a fruit, a fruit badge right here. We won't say what fruit. And I, I'm a master of that technology and that particular manufacturer's products. And yes, you think of me as being a brand ambassador for that company. I have other scenarios where I dress a little nicer, a little, a little more tech savvy than you would find inside of a big box retail door. But my lanyard here might say Brett Beverage and it might say T-Rock on the lanyard right here. But anyway, the customer sees you as an extension of the brand that you're in. And it's super important. I like to call us corporate chameleons. That means I have my own culture, but I got to also adapt the culture of the customer. You know, in Target, you say, what can I help you find today? In Walmart, you might say, we have everyday low prices. Mm. Um, in Costco, when you're doing a road show, you might say, come on, let me show you this Cutco knife set. It's totally different vibes and not each employee will work in each of those scenarios. You got you to really be, be careful on the talent acquisition part. Understood. What, what, is, what inspired you to write the book, Do It Anyway? You know, there are so many people that I've run into over the years and me being an entrepreneur pretty much my whole life, but having that three or four year stint at a big company, which, which was Nextel that later became Sprint, uh, kind of gave me a two of three perspectives. Number one, a lot of people want to be an entrepreneur. You're living proof, right? You, you, you decided to graduate high school and you went through college to a certain point and you said, I need to start my own business. A lot of people are in your boat. So it's written for that person um, if they're deciding whether they should work in a large company or a more stable environment or be an entrepreneur. It's also for the person that might be working for 20, 25 years as a middle manager uh, in a cube uh, running reporting all day long. And they're like, man, I've always wanted to start my own business, but now I have a wife, I have kids, I have bills to pay. And it's even for the person who might be 60, 65 that just retired but 65 now is young. It's not, it's not like the old days and they still have gas in the tank and they have passion and energy. And they said, I've always wanted to do this. So it's written for those three constituencies. And basically the punchline is, and there's a lot of anecdotes and a lot of stories along the way and a lot of, you know, tactics along the way that can help you achieve and not bump your head as much as I have, which is why I'm a little weird. (laughs) Um, You got it. You got it. You got to go for it. If you have the resources, if you have the support system, if you have the cash, if you love what it is that you're doing and you, and you believe in it and you can have fun doing it and you're questioning it because you're scared and you're nervous and you're not sure, I say do it anyway. You don't want to look back when you're 80 and say shoulda, coulda, woulda. 100%, 100% that. So, so this book is going to be for people who are at a point in their life where they're looking at, and they're saying, hey, I want to take the leap. Uh, I'm assuming do it anyway, right? I want to take the leap, but I want to I want to skip a lot of the learning curve and a lot of headaches and failures that I might encounter, and I can learn from Brett's experience rather than do it on my own. Correct, and, so, it's, so, and it's really me telling stories, not to say do it my way, is to say do it your way. But think about your culture. Your culture might not be like my culture. You might have your own culture, and you know there are some key components though that are very universal. You you mentioned it at the beginning. I think 99% of companies never make it to a million dollars and 99% of those don't last more than five years. So Mm. it's way, way more efficient to not reinvent the wheel and not just my book, but you can, you know, you have to have mentors and a team and people who care about you that want to see your success. 
How has God been a, a part of your success and your growth? Uh, you know, I've, I've always been a, you know, a strong believer. I wouldn't tell you that I'm at church every Sunday, but I do have a personal one-on-one -on -one relationship. I am spiritual in that regard. Uh, I feel like uh, it's, it's helped me through some, some very trying times and, and wanting to just make sure that I felt like I was on the right path. And especially when, you know, when you, when you get into those glitches, uh, you, you, you know, you immediately become religious, right? But it's, it's what happens in between those times, you know, God, if you get me out of this problem, I promise I'll, I'll be good. <laughs> just being honest. Right. But, but uh, I, you know, the, the, the magic is when you do it in between, when you do it consistently and all the time and you're, you're praying and you're, you're, you're reaching out and you're, you have a relationship with, uh, with whoever your God might be. How has business positively or negatively impacted family, whether it's wife, children, and so forth? I'm blessed with an amazing support system. I'm telling you, I have over three and a half million miles on American. I probably have three million miles on Delta. Uh, for the last 20, maybe 30 years, I've been uh, away from home, maybe up to 150 nights, maybe 160 nights. I used to travel 20 every years? Monday for, for 20 years, yeah. Oh, 20, each year for 20 years, you'll be away for almost half the year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, when I started the dot-com company called Let's Talk.com, I would leave every Monday morning on a, on a flight at 5.30 a.m. I'd get to San Fran at 10.30. I would work. It was a 24-hour day because it was a startup, and we worked until 10 or 11 at night, which for me was 2 in the morning because I was three hours ahead. And then I'd take the red eye back every Friday night, so I'd get home on Saturday morning at 9.30. So I was gone all week, and I did that for a year. So, you know, I'm, I'm, they've been very – and my wife was pregnant with our third baby – during that time. So I'm blessed to have an amazing wife. My kids are very supportive. Uh, and so it, it, you need that. If you don't have that, it, it could be a problem. How important in, in, in this new economy with social media, digital marketing, online marketing, and having such an online president, how important is it to build a personal brand to grow a business nowadays? I think it's very important. Uh, I think you have to be an authority in your space. I think it's opened the door a lot for anyone to become an authority whether you have 20 or 30 years experience or whether you're just starting out uh, and you know this, I mean, you have this podcast, you have a, your reach is probably growing every time and you are establishing yourself as some place where people want to go to learn. And they, you know, you're doing this entrepreneur shark tank like scenario, you're attracting more people. I think it's in today's world, CEOs have to have exposure to the communities on the and exposure on the platforms they have to write articles. They have to speak at events. Uh, they have to be respected by others that are respected. And so it's it's not my favorite thing to do, but it's a, it's a, it's a definite requirement. For will, me we, do. will we be seeing you on more stages, more books, more podcasts in the future? Yeah, we're, I, I, I'm doing two or three uh, at, per month at this point. And I think when the book comes out, it's going to be amplified. It's going to be more. Uh, but I was on a you know small little television show uh, last week, and I've done several podcasts on entrepreneurship and on outsourcing. I've spoken at auto trade shows and uh, Greater Miami Chamber of Commerce. I was just recently a speaker at the Wharton School of Business event there. And I'm actually, on the 8th of March, I will be moderating a panel with the mayor of my of Miami, Mayor Suarez, who's huge on technology. If you haven't heard, he's inviting all of these Silicon Valley companies and New York companies to Miami to, to be more of a tech central uh, entity. And I mentioned the dean of the School of Business, Dean Quell, she'll be there as well. So it's 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 that part's fun. I mean, it's very dynamic. <laughs> it's never a dull moment, and um, and I'm, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying that part of the ride. As we wrap up, what can we expect from you, from T-Rock, from Bet Beverage himself in the near future? Thanks for asking. So the book, we already talked about that. That's going to yep. be coming out soon. We are a growth-minded company. We'll always be a growth-minded company. So we're going to amaze our current customers, do everything we can to keep those customers and grow those businesses, but also continue to reach out with complementary types of, of offerings that make us kind of a one-stop shop for our, for our, uh, for our customers. Also want to continue to focus on cracking this code on what, how much of our business is remote, how much is in the office. That's changed the world a lot. And so there's a lot to figure out there, but it's also making sure that we're, we're enjoying the ride. I mean, taking, taking, 
taking the victories and taking a, a quick bow, but then getting back down into improving the business. So same, a lot of the, the course will be the same this year as last year. What is a challenge that's top of mind that you're currently overcoming? People, people, people. It has never been harder for us to find top quality people. And I'm sure you're hearing this, whoever you speak with, but you know, we are a people company. Everyone says that, but the biggest brands in the world come to us to have access to our people so we can help them build market share. So that balance between lowering your stand, you got to keep your standard high. You don't just want a heartbeat. You need to really make sure you're identifying and hiring and developing the right talent and that those people can also be promoted and, and grow down the line. So it's all about people. 10 years ago, I had no recruiting department. Today, I have 100 people. All they do all day is look for people. Just, for, just recruiting, recruiting. And now, uh, last question, how can we get in contact with Brett? How can we learn more about you, get in contact with you, and so forth? Sure, th thanks for that. Uh, you can go to brettbeverage.com. Uh, on LinkedIn, you can find me at uh, Brett Beverage. And on Insta, it's like at Beverage. And on Facebook, it's Ask B Beverage. So Insta on- Ask Beverage, Insta, uh, Facebook, Ask B Beverage, yeah. Ask B Beverage. And so in this episode, we learn number one, the seven C's, how to be, to be calm, create confidence in your business, communicate, and not only just communicate, but over communicate, have compassion, collaborate, create a community, and also have some cash in the bank. Mm -hmm. Now, we also talked about cr crisis management, we talked about creating culture in your business, and we talked about how to pivot. We also discussed how Brett's book is going to be coming out in the next few months, Do It Anyway. We talked about the different businesses that Brett owned, and also his six-step process, if you were to start all over again and build a multi or a million-dollar business, what he would do is, number one, if, if you didn't hear it at least seven times in this podcast, is have scalability in mind. Number two, have it be high margin. Number three, have it have no inventory. Number four, uh, residual income something like subscription. Number five, have a bigger ticket with high revenue. And number six, last but not least, low penetration, meaning that there's a big need in the market and you can fill that need and there's not a lot of competition, man. Brett, thank you so much for being on today's episode of the Andy Audate Show. I love, having, I love being here. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Brett.